Listen up, real estate investors, entrepreneurs, and agents. You're in the right place. Unlocking the secrets to real estate investing and entrepreneurship. Welcome to the Titanium Vault, hosted by RJ Bates III. Here's RJ. Hello, and welcome to the Titanium Vault. I'm your host, RJ Bates. Today, I'm sitting down with Tucker Maryhew. Tucker, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, RJ. Thanks for having me uh, on your show. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So why don't you take a second to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do in real estate investing. Sure. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, my name is Tucker Maryhew. I am a uh, real estate investor. I guess I'd fall under that uh, rather large umbrella um, in the Portland uh, metro area, which Portland, Oregon which used to be a, a much smaller, sleepier market, but it has grown up dramatically in the last 10 years. And so now it's uh, more of a, almost a destination type market. So I do a whole variety of stuff here. Um, you know, we do a little bit of wholesaling, but mainly uh, fix and flip and uh, new construction and development deals. Awesome. How long have you been in business? So I've been in real estate since 2002. Um, I've been uh, the owner and uh, I guess uh, head cheese at TTM Development Company, which is essentially our um, construction slash house flipping slash building company uh, since 2008. So uh, I did a number of kind of one-off flip deals, some house hacking type stuff from 2002 to 2008, bought a few rentals. Uh, and then in 2008, that's when we or I – um, kind of solidified the vision of, you know, making this uh, kind of my full-time adventure and, and doing as many projects and deals as we can and growing the business. So from 2008 until now, here we are, end of 2017, I've been the, uh, you know, the head guy here at TTM Development Company. So you mentioned that Portland has changed over the years. Let's talk about how different it is today from 2002. Sure. So 2002, just to give you a little bit of frame of reference, I bought my first house in 2002. Uh, actually, it was the beginning of 2003. So I, I graduated college 2002, got into the mortgage game, um, got myself a nice stated, stated loan with my lovely 700 plus credit score. And uh, I bought a house uh, for $240,000. That house today is probably worth five fifty ish something like that. Wow. Um, I, I sold it in 2006 before the collapse, so fortuitous and very lucky timing <laughs> in hindsight, uh, and cashed out almost 200 grand at that point. But um, I guess my point is, is that the market has changed dramatically. It went from a much more affordable um, city overall uh, to you know a city with higher price points and a lot of infill redevelopment. Um, a lot of neighborhoods that were okay, you know, 15 years ago are now super hot. Um, much higher priced as a result of that, much trendier, a lot more, you know, commerce, a lot more businesses, a lot more coffee shops, a lot more, you know, uh, trendy hipsters. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've, I've wholesaled a couple of properties in Portland, but I also do much more volume in Austin, Texas. And those two markets are very similar in my opinion, because like you just said, they're trendy. Um, you know, here in Texas, we say keep Austin weird and, and I've kind of seen similarities in, in Portland, Oregon. W when you talk about Portland being a trendy city, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, the whole phrase, keep Austin weird, that was actually a copycat of Portland. <laughs> so keep Portland weird was the, uh, original with there that phrase. Go. And, uh, Austin's kind of been compared to Portland, like our, um, I guess sister city, as if that's what they call it right. in terms of just kind of overall feel and type of person we don't have uh, we've got you know portland state and university of portland here but you know austin you've got a, a much bigger one university there right. um, or you probably have a few smaller ones too but portland's it's just a it's a bigger city i think than austin overall in terms of sprawl and just um you know it's the mecca of oregon essentially but um, in terms of trendiness you know, just to give you an example, we do a lot of investing in Southeast Portland, and, and Southeast Portland used to be a lot of like rundown kind of uh, 30s, 40s construction, um, and now a lot of that is gone, and you've got a lot of newer construction, um, you know, infill new construction that's gone on, and with that, then there's been a lot of new commercial developments that have happened. 
so you know you got new shopping centers you got new coffee shops you got a lot of new starbucks you got a lot of new um you know just uh like if you drive down a major thoroughfare now in southeast portland it used to be kind of run down old dilapidated businesses now you've got you know uh, new businesses down below uh apartments condos above um that kind of thing so that draws in a more trendier crowd there's a lot more people moving here now too to kind of they want to experience the lifestyle of portland so you get a lot of trendiness you get a lot of um you know outsiders coming to portland so it's it's turned into kind of a giant melting pot of of overall trendiness i guess would be a good way to put it so let's go back to 2008 when you became the the head honcho for your company and how did you get your start and and how did did you start out with fix and flips or were you contracting or how did that come to develop in 2008 so um prior to that i owned my own mortgage company uh from about 2005 until then and so you know it was a day it was august 2007 where the mortgage company basically got turned on its head or the mortgage industry uh, every you know wholesale banker out there called their brokers and said we're freezing pipelines, which basically meant the industry was changing dramatically. And so at that point or after that, I realized that that was just going to be a really difficult way to make a living moving forward. And so I'd always wanted to be in the investing side. And so that was a good excuse for me to transition all the way. And so um, I started TTM Development Company in 2008. And basically, at that point in time, uh, you know, I don't know if you were involved uh, doing much real estate wise at that point, but it was hard to wholesale because everybody was kind of running from it, you know, as opposed to running to it. Right now, everybody's running to real estate. But in 2008, you know, people thought they were going to lose the money that was in the bank. They wanted to see if it was FDIC insured, you know. Um, real estate was kind of like the last thing people wanted to put their money in at that point because they felt like the sky was still falling. And so, it was hard to wholesale, especially here in Portland at that point, because there was just there there wasn't a lot of money in Portland at that point. I mean, there was money, but we're not talking like you know none of the big operations were going. There wasn't a lot of big buyers. Um, you know, most of those guys got punched in the mouth and they kind of fell off through the collapse. So I kind of was forced into uh, rehabbing to start with, and fortunately, it worked out because in that forcing me to actually rehab and retail these properties, I soon realized that there was a strong demand for a turnkey entry level product for those people that hadn't gotten bit and bought in the previous two, three years. And so uh, we did our first deal under uh, TTM Development Company in 2008. It was a quick, uh, I mean, at the time it wasn't that quick, but looking back, it should have been a quick flip, simple ranch, three bedroom, two bath, 1100 square foot property, one level, simple ranch style home. And uh, we made 55 grand on it. We put about 28 grand into it. So it was a pretty good, you know, uh, return in terms of work done and price point. Uh, we bought it for 102, and I think we sold it for somewhere about 190 to 200. Uh, and after all the dust settled and everything, I made about 55 grand. So that was the first one, and that was kind of proof of concept post the collapse, we'll call it. Right. And uh, from there, you know, I said, well. I guess this works, you know, this whole retailing thing, there's buyers out there. Then the whole big tax incentive thing happened, um, you know, where basically uh, the government gave first time home buyers a lot of money to go out and buy homes. And uh, that fed the fire for that type of product that we were putting to market on a retail level. And so one turned into two, two turned into four, and uh, we just started going from there. So let's talk about financing these properties. You talk about back in 2008, everybody was running away from real estate. And no one wanted to put their money into it. How did you finance those deals back then compared to how are you financing deals now that you're doing? So back then, again, the price points were much lower. Um, but the first deal, actually the first two deals, um, I had saved up a fair bit of money of my own from running my mortgage company that I hadn't totally blown on, you know, uh, late nights and nice cars and things like that, which was seemed to be the MO back then. Um, but I also made a, like I said, a fair, uh, fair bit of change on the first uh, primary residence that I lived in and then sold and took that money tax free. So I, I financed the first deal, uh, myself, put all my money where my mouth was and did that deal. And then from there, as we wanted to do more than one, because I could only afford to do one, you know, lower price point deal at a time with my own cash. Beyond that, I then had to go find money. And so um, funny story, but the the sole sponsor of my own podcast, the Real Deals podcast is a company called Iron Bridge Lending. And right now they're a huge company here based out of Portland or they've grown into be a huge company with multiple millions of dollars under management. 
Well, at the time, it was just starting out, and uh, the owner named Gerard was a good friend of mine. And, uh, you know, I remember, still remember the, uh, meeting that we had that was, a you know, one office over here in the same office that I have. And he came in and said, Hey, I've raised some money. I got to put it to work. And so we used that relationship, um, to really start the expansion of the number of projects that we could do. And so ultimately we started out with my capital and hard money and, uh, eventually it's grown dramatically. We've raised a, a you know, five, $6 million worth of private money that we use in addition to our own capital here within the company. And occasionally some some hard money went absolutely needed. But um, we started with my own money. We, le we leveraged that into hard money. And then as we built a reputation and, uh, you know, figured out what the hell we were doing, um, we eventually, you know, marketed for and uh, created some private money relationships. And so that's where most of our lending comes from now. Fast forward to 2017. Gotcha. So with Portland being a hot market right now, what kind of marketing are you doing or how are you acquiring properties? So we've been uh, big on the direct mail train for years. Um, we started doing a lot of direct mail all the way back in 2010. Um, we were buying REOs at that point, but we started to see the writing on the wall and the prices were getting even bid up a little bit as you got towards the end of 2010. So we started our direct mail, um, you know, I guess tour of duty and direct mail way back then. We still do a ton of it today. Um, we layer our marketing with a, a number of other um you know, options as well. We do, you know, um, some email marketing, some Facebook marketing. Uh, we do some slide dialing. We do, a, you know, a ton of direct mail marketing. So kind of a combination of things, but I would say the driver of everything is our direct mail. And so we've really gotten good at perfecting um, how to use direct mail. It is more expensive to use it these days than it was, you know, even three years ago by a significant amount just because there's so many more people that have kind of jumped on that train. Most of them don't have a clue what they're doing and they just throw more money at it and they think more money is just going to solve the problems. So it makes a lot more noise in people's mailboxes and you got to cut through that clutter to get them to pay attention to you and, you know, ultimately raise their hand so that you can talk to them about potentially buying their house. But that's the main driver. And so we build uh, custom lists. Uh, I built an app that we used internally, and now any investor can buy it called the Driving for Dollars app. But originally, we built it for my own business here. And so we build a ton of custom lists in all the parts of Portland and the surrounding areas that we want to be. Um, we basically take those lists. We mail them with our specialty direct mail pieces. Uh, we then will slide dial them. We'll pull their phone numbers. We'll slide dial them. We'll take those people. We'll pull. We'll skip trace them. We'll pull their email addresses. We'll put those email addresses in Facebook. We'll run Facebook ads to those exact profiles. Uh, we'll do blast emails to those people. Um, all, all kinds of stuff. So that's kind of it starts with direct mail, but then it kind of snowballs into a variety of other things to layer our marketing. Do you have a specific position within your company? that utilizes the driving for dollars app. Yeah, we do our, uh, our acquisitions manager. Um, and then also, um, you know, our basically the individual that handles the, um, podcast side of my business, he's more of the tech guy. So he'll go out and, and generate a lot of those lists. Cause he was actually the one that helped me build it. Um, so those two guys generally build the lists and, um, it's a cool app because you can have one account and it can be used on multiple phones. So that's how we do it. So we have our one account set up and so different guys can add to it depending on, you know, who's going out and doing it that day. But it's basically, you know, just to quantify it for you and everybody listening, you know, Dan went out, uh, last week and within about two and a half hours, he built a list of 800 new driving for dollars leads using the app, which, you know, back before we had this, that would have taken us like, you know, two and a half months uh, with the, you know, manual process of it. Right. So you talk about you, you get send an acquisitions manager out, he's using the driver for dollars app, and then you go and you skip trace it. And you can even go to where you run a Facebook ad specific to that person's profile. How often do you see leads come in through Facebook? Um, not a ton to be honest, but again, I look at it as it's, it's a brand building recognition type layering strategy. So we're, we're looking to remind them, right? And so it, it, it's a, it layers on the fact that it cuts, it helps cut through the clutter on the direct mail piece that they get or the slide dial message that they get. Um, you know, it just makes them feel like we're everywhere. We do a lot of IP targeting as well, so we're not just on Facebook, but we follow them all around the internet also with other types of ads. So it's, you know, I don't try and look at a specific ROI for those types of marketing. Um, I kind of look at those as in addition to marketing areas um, that help support our main driver, which is direct mail. Gotcha. So once you acquire these properties, 
let's talk about managing the rehabs. Right now, the vast majority of your business is in rehabs, correct? Uh, I would say we're probably 25% rehab, 75% new construction. Okay. But when you're running these leads, you're still getting leads that turn into the new construction, correct? Exactly. Yeah. So you're, as, you're just taking those old houses from the 30s and 40s and tearing them down because that's what your market demands right now. Exactly. Now back, like we talked about 2002, it couldn't be done. Even 2006, it was hard to get that done because price points hadn't come up to the point where that makes sense, right? But right. now in this brave new world of 2017, 2018, there's a lot more areas of Portland that can absorb new construction pricing. So that's why we pivoted uh, to be able to take advantage of that in addition to our rehabbing. So um, you know, ultimately, we landed on doing that more than rehabbing because it's easier to manage. It's easier to put it on a conveyor belt. It's more predictable in costs. And ultimately, uh, you know, the margins that we're able to create are usually significantly larger than that of a rehab. Okay. So let's talk about how you manage those projects. Do you have a staff specifically for the, the rehabs and the new constructions? Do you have project managers on staff? Yeah, so kind of the, the best way to think about it is like, um, you know, I'm kind of sitting at the top of the pyramid, right? I'm, I'm the, the, the visionary slash big cheese slash whatever you want to call me, right? And so to my right is my office manager, uh, which we kind of talked about, acquisition slash office manager, Chris. And so he takes all our incoming calls, um, you know, deals with all the incoming leads that happen from our marketing, um, basically helps fill the construction pipeline through sifting, sorting, you know, talking to people on the phone, presenting contracts, getting contracts signed, all that. He's also our realtor. So on the disposition end, he also lists and sells all our stuff. But then to my left, I have a project manager who's in the field who we used to have a, an individual that worked for us for about uh, six years who was our project manager. He recently left because he wanted to be a big cheese on his own. Um, so I wish him you know, best of luck. But before he left, my wife who works with me, she trained him. And so she had previously been our project manager, but then she kind of transitioned to doing all of our design for our projects. She's now transitioned back into project management and design. So to my left is her and under her, We've got a, a couple of laborers that kind of do a lot of our in-between labor um, that she manages on a daily basis. And then she also manages all of our subcontractors. So we're, we're a licensed general contractor also. So we can, you know, as a licensed contractor, we have, you know, we, we are generaling every job. Um, and then we subcontract out a lot of the uh, trade work because that just makes our job a lot easier as the general. Gotcha. When you're analyzing a lead that comes in and you're contemplating making it a new construction project, how are you breaking down the numbers? What are you comparing it to? Are you looking for someone else to have already done new construction or sometimes are you the first person in a neighborhood to do new construction? We have been the first person. I tend to not like to be these days. Um, you know, we... It used to be much more prevalent that we would have to be in order to kind of push the boundaries of where new construction could, uh, the economics could work for it. Now there's a lot of stupider money out there that's pushing it all over the place. So we can kind of follow that <laughs> and let them be the leader to do proof of concept for price points in new areas. Um, so we mainly focus on now, though, the most desirable areas for the stuff that we're going to keep. So we're really not pushing, uh, you know, the limits in terms of where those value lines are. We're building within pre-established, easily recognizable value lines um, because most of the stuff that we build up now, you know, new construction wise, you know, we've got projects on the table right now that we're in construction for that are anywhere from a million four to three million plus. Um, so, you know, they're pretty high dollar stuff. Um, there is one lower, I guess we'll call it lower price for what we're doing, new construction, where we're, you know, uh, guessing that the, the exit price on the finished product will be somewhere in the 799 range, so almost 800 grand. Um, but that's, that's as low as we go. So we're, we're mainly focusing in, in established neighborhoods. Um, we do have one project that we're completing right now that's a three-lot uh, partition deal where you know the new construction that would be built on those lots the end product would probably sell for in the 499 range um, but we may just sell those lots off to a lower price builder um, just because there's such a, a crunch for any sort of buildable lot inventory um, in the portland metro area and so 
we can make a great profit just by getting those lots split and then selling those off. So we may just sell those off, but um, that was an area that previously w the economics did not work at all for new construction. It's kind of a newer phenomenon that it works. Um, so I guess to answer your question, we don't really push the envelope anymore. We have in the past, but we just don't really need to. When you're doing the new construction projects, are you taking down a much smaller size property and then increasing the square footage on your new build? I see that a lot here in Dallas where you're essentially buying like a 1,500 to 2,000 square foot house, tearing that down, and you're going to build something that's five to 6,000 square feet. And that's what's getting you the high margins. Is that similar to what you're doing or is it just the fact that it's new construction and it's in Portland that's driving the price up? Um, it sounds like people in, in Dallas area are, are pushing that square footage number out to try and, you know, basically arbitrage the cost to build square footage versus the cost that you can sell it at or right. the price you can sell it at to kind of create more margin. So they're going more vertical to build more margin. We don't do that as much here. That's kind of seems to me like a little bit more of a dangerous play, honestly. Right. Um, we'll buy the seven to 900 square foot stuff that's exceeded its life expectancy. So um, anything that's 1,500, 2,000 square feet is generally rehabable um, in the Portland area and probably makes the most sense because then you can exit at a, a much more meat and potatoes type price point. Um, if you got to tear down a 2,000 footer and build a 6,000 square foot new construction that's place to get your margin, that's a dangerous game just in general, I would say. Um, you know, unless you're in, you know, super, super high dollar area and there's a demand for that size of house. I would say in Portland, you know, the biggest house that we've built um, over the years has been 5,200 square feet. So I don't see the need to build anything bigger than that here in the Portland area. There's just not, a, you know, 5,200 square feet here in Portland seems like a big house. Um, there just isn't a strong demand for more than that. So we wouldn't venture into let's tear down a larger square footage house to build a ginormous square footage house in its place. Generally, we quantified the leads and, uh, you know, we look for, um, when we're doing our driving for dollars, like a seven to 900 square foot house, two bedroom, one bath, maybe a three one that's in an area that has new construction that's selling for at least 800 grand. Um, and then more obviously in some of the areas that we do it in, but we're looking for the smaller square footage houses, generally sub a thousand square feet, generally sub three bedrooms. And then we replace that with anywhere between a 3000 to 5,000 square foot home, depending on neighborhood, depending on price point. Gotcha. So you've been doing this for quite a while and you've been doing it within one market. Have you ever contemplated expanding to other remote markets or other markets surrounding you? Yeah, in 2012, uh, 2013, we contemplated going to Bend, which if you've never been to Bend, Oregon, it's an amazing place. Um, I wish we had because Bend is like California. It's a boom-bust market, and it boomed uh, dramatically since then, so we would have made a just an absolute killing. But with that said, um, we didn't just because I felt like it would stretch our focus. And, you know, we have – a lot of money that's being put to work here in Portland. Our marketing machine works well here. So I have just decided that, you know, if it's working well here, why overcomplicate things? And, um, you know, why go elsewhere unless it's a lifestyle, lifestyle decision and I want to spend some time there as well? Um, otherwise, it just doesn't make sense for us to kind of spread our focus and expand our operations. If we can just expand our operations within the Portland metro area to make more money. Gotcha. Do you do any buy and holds? Yeah, I've got a, a number of rentals. Um, we've got one right now that uh, I'm, I was kicking around buying and holding. It's a duplex with a great return here in Portland. But the challenge here in Portland is that the price point, it's an equity market, not a cash flow market by a, a huge margin. And, and what I mean by that is that you get a real dismal return on the amount of capital it takes to buy something for rent. Um, so, you know, for example, the duplex that we're renovating right now that I bought you know, we bought it at like, um, you know, more than 1% a month in rent that we get um, after it's rehab. So it's two sides, it's four bedrooms on each side. We can get about 2000 bucks a month in rent. We'll be all in about 400 grand. It, it'll rent combined for anywhere between 42 and $4,300 a month. But I can sell that at less than half a percent a month in rent. So the, the amount of margin that we can create on that is huge. I could use the tax deduction 4,200 bucks a month of easy money sounds great, um, but it's hard to pass up 200 grand in profit, um, you know, on a light rehab. So to answer your question, we're not keeping a ton right now just because the economics don't work great for it. Um, you know, you, the 
velocity of the money and turning it over. It just it makes more sense right now. But that's not to say when the next shift happens that um, you know we won't keep more stuff. But generally, the stuff that we've kept over the last couple of years has been keep it, rent it with um, you know future redevelopment in mind, which basically means nuking the existing construction and building new or dividing lots and building multiple new houses. So you brought up that you also have your own podcast, the Real Deals podcast. I know you have the Driving for Dollars app, and then also in, in within your podcast, every now and then you open up different bits and pieces of education for other investors. Talk to me a little bit about what that means to you and, and why you do that and, and, and kind of what is your what is your focus as far as the podcast and the education and the app and all those things that you do for other investors? So, you know, kind of like we were talking about before we went live here, um, you know, you like to do this because it's kind of like your, your getaway from your business, right? I mean, it's the same business, but it's, it's a little kind of, um, it's a little staycation, we'll call it, from the daily grind. And so right. I started off doing the podcast because I also, that's the same reason, I enjoy um, you know, connecting with other investors, just like we're chatting right now. And so we built a community off of that, um, that now, you know, we've got 120 plus people in this mastermind community that we've built off of the podcast. And, you know, honestly, I, I just love interacting with people all over the country that are legitimately doing this business every day. You know, there's a lot of people online that are kind of, um, you know, they're doing their quick tour of duty. And I don't particularly enjoy putting a lot of time into those people because I know they're going to be on to Bitcoin or Litecoin or something like that tomorrow and not in real estate. But the guys that are legitimately doing this every day and have been, um, you know, I love making those connections and I love talking to them. And with our community, you know, we have people all over the country. So, you know, I get a heat check on basically what's going on in every single major metro market, uh, you know, in, in just a, a second if I hop online and just ask, you know. So it kind of connects me to all these other markets around the country, um, but it also connects me to them. And, and I just, you know, I've built a lot of amazing relationships with people. Um, you know, one individual in particular who's partnered with us to provide direct mail services for our app is Justin Silverio. Uh, who is the owner of Open Letter Marketing. I mean, you know, great guy, but there's countless guys like him that I've connected with and made relationships with that I never would have if I didn't start the podcast. Right. It, I mean, you bring that up, like connecting with other investors. Just in the past two days, I've interviewed someone in North Carolina, Las Vegas, and now Portland, Oregon. I mean, I've, I've essentially gone across the country. I've gotten to talk to them about those markets. And each market is completely different. And uh, it really opens up your eyes to how real estate investing has so many different ways to be successful. There's not one particular way that you're supposed to do this. Um, there's a lot of a lot of people talk about the same marketing strategies, the same you know ways to to build your businesses and the same roles that they have, but the markets really demand on what you should do within your market. Like for you, rentals is not a good strategy within Portland, Oregon, but new construction is. You're, you're saying 75% of your business is new construction, which I'll be hard pressed to find another guest that's gonna tell me that. And, and that's amazing to hear. It opens up to my eyes to the Portland market and, and what can be done within it. And so that's, I, I love sharing that with the guest. And, you know, I appreciate you coming on here and, and sharing that about your business because, uh, to be honest with you, I would not have guessed that that was going to be an answer that you were going to give me today. Is, <laughs> well, is that new construction is that, that much of your business? I mean, it's just, it's kind of unheard of within other markets. Yeah, well, I'm glad I could surprise you. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Absolutely. You know, there, there are guys here that just straight rehab, so I don't want to paint the picture like you can't just straight rehab. But, you know, we've kind of moved with the cheese, so to speak, right? And, you know, we've also – I've always had this desire to continue climbing the real estate ladder in terms of being able to expand the scope of what we can do as a company – and so a lot of people are scared to cross that bridge, even if new construction is a viable option in their market. And, you know, we crossed it all the way back uh, 2012, uh, 2011, 2012 was our first project. And once we crossed that bridge or, you know, got the kahunas to do it, um, you know, we never looked back because we realized that it's it honestly is an easier way to do this business. Um, but it, just a lot of people feel like they can't do it for whatever reason. Um, and so they don't. But 
you know, Portland, like you mentioned, it has the luxury and the economics in play that we can do it in a lot of different parts of Portland now. Whereas, you know, places like Indianapolis, you're real hard pressed to do it anywhere, um, especially infill because the price points just aren't there. So it drives you to be more of a cash flow rental, um, you know, rehab type market. Right. So let's talk about 2018 and 2019. Where do you foresee the Portland market going? Is it going to continue to trend upward or is it going to level off some? We got a lot of things at play, but one thing Portland has a um, couple constraints. Number one is we have what they call an urban growth boundary, which doesn't exist in my knowledge and, and <laughs> definitely not in Houston. I don't know about where you're at, but basically right. what that means is that uh, this uh, council of people that are supposed to be smarter than everybody else, which, you know, that's up for debate, um, get together and they determine whether or not um, they'll push out the urban growth boundary, which basically means can massive new development occur past certain, um, you know, lines around the city. And so they constrain the amount of developable land around the Portland area. And basically what that does is that then that constrains the supply of new housing and when you have a lot of people moving here, like is projected and is happening, um, you basically have, you know, limited supply and you have a lot of demand. And so I think that that's going to be a theme that continues in the next year. It's not going to be solved. That's for sure. The bureaucracy and the difficulties of actually getting stuff built here um, is insane uh, a lot of days. And, you know, that's the downside of what we deal with with the new construction. But, um, you know, that, that process isn't going to get any easier. There isn't going to be an abundance of land that just all of a sudden can be developed. And there's still going to be a big influx of people moving here. So I think for at least 2018, I think we're going to continue to see a lot of the same. Um, you know, we'll see how much interest rates go up if, or if they do next year. That might put a little bit of downward pressure on pricing here. But um, overall, I think we're going to see much of the same. So you brought up something that just real quick, we don't have to go into great detail about this, but how long does it take you to get a permit in the city of Portland? Um, it's generally... City of Portland is probably eight weeks to get a building permit. We do most of our building in Lake Oswego, which is a suburb of Portland, just south. Um, and that's about three to four weeks after delivering plans. And then from there, it's about six months um, from breaking ground to finish on the construction of the, of the actual house. Okay. That's too long for me. I don't, I don't have the patience for that. <laughs> I, would, I would lose my mind. It's, so. I mean, it's, you got to look at it as um, it, it, takes a while because you got to put projects in one end before they pop out the other right and as you put them in one end and you're doing new construction it takes a long time before they pop out but eventually you start stuffing more and more in there and then it becomes a more of a conveyor belt of popping out on the other end so yeah there's there's a process there on the front end where you know you're doing a lot of construction and not getting a lot of money coming back in but once once you get it up and up to speed it's it's a great uh, it's a great system but yeah i hear what you're saying there yeah before we wrap up, I, you brought this up and it sounded like you had a, a pretty strong opinion about it. So I'm going to ask you about it because it's all the rage right now. Uh, cryptocurrency, and it seems like 95% of real estate investors have some kind of opinion about this. It, 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 there's like this tangled web. If you're a real estate investor, suddenly you have to have an opinion about cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, <laughs> Litecoin. Uh, what are your thoughts about it and, and should real estate investors take the time to, to analyze and look into cryptocurrency? So I guess my opinion is if I was actually into it and smart enough to have bought Bitcoin, uh, you know, long, long ago, um, then, you know, I'd be sitting really pretty. But the way I look at it right now is if I got to buy in on Bitcoin, and I put a hundred grand on the line and I hope that it doubles to make 200 grand. And I'm literally hoping like going to Vegas, hoping um, I just. I'm going to stick with real estate because I know I can take that 100 grand and I know I can make it 200 grand without any downside risk, really. So for me. Yeah, you're right. It's kind of like um, it's the new hot thing. Uh, and it seems like if you're a real estate investor, then you've got excess money. So therefore, you should be buying cryptocurrency with it. You know, I don't know what people should do with their money. But for me personally, I know what my core competency is. My core competency is real estate, real estate investing. So I would just prefer to continue to master my own craft. And, um, you know, ultimately, that's going to be the more rewarding path for me. So that's where I keep my focus. I don't know what the correct answer is, but I keep asking people and successful people keep giving me the same answer. So 
What's that uh, answer? For, uh, <laughs> is what you just gave, okay. which right. is if if I have a hundred thousand and I'm hoping that I could double it to two hundred thousand, I'm just gonna take that hundred thousand and do what I do every day, and I know I'm gonna make X amount of dollars instead of hoping. So, for some of the listeners, maybe you're catching on on what my answer is to that question. Um, anyways. So let, let's move on towards the end of this uh, interview and, and get to the, the meats and bones of uh, where you want your business to be here in the future. So uh, let's talk about where do you want your company to go within the next five years? So, you know, I want us to continue growing. Um, you know, I think we're going to get into probably some, some multifamily and commercial ground up uh, construction at some point here, we've got one project that we've got under contract right now that I'm meeting with the city actually next week to go through all of the ins and outs of what's possible. Um, but, you know, my big thing is that I want to continue climbing the real estate ladder. I want to continue climbing to be able to do bigger and, and you know, just cooler projects. Um, you know, people didn't start out building skyscrapers, right? They started, they probably started out rehabbing a house. And then that went into something else and went into something else. And so, you know, I've got a little bit of the entrepreneurial disease, I guess, in that I get bored um, a little bit easily, more easily than the average person, which is why we're crazy enough to, you know, take on this entrepreneurial life. But, uh, you know, to kind of prevent the boredom, I'm always trying to push the envelope on what it is that we can do, you know, within reason, of course. And, um, you know, right now we've we've transitioned from rehabbing to doing new construction to doing luxury high dollar new construction. Um, we've done some multifamily build, smaller stuff from ground up. We've done some townhome projects. Um, so now, I'm, you know, I'm looking at, you know, can we do some bigger uh, multifamily buildings? Can we get into the commercial space? Can we start doing that? So I think over the next five years, you know, um, that's the direction that we're going. I always think it's important to explain to someone who wants to get into this business or is listening to this podcast and says, I've always wanted to be in real estate investing. For someone who's been doing this since 2002, you've been on your own since 2008, what is your why? What is the driving force behind everything that you've created? Uh, I got a good quote here for you that I'll weave in at some point. But, you know, this has been a big conversation piece for a lot of people. And, you know, uh, every, everybody's status quo answer is, you know, if they've got kids or wife, they're like, well, my family, of course. And, you know, I think that's a, a given. But... You know, I, I've also seen that just because you have a lot of uh, money and success, that doesn't mean that it can't screw up your family. So I don't think that that should be the sole reason why people, um, you know, get up and, and strive to do more every day than they did yesterday. I think ultimately my biggest why is myself. Uh, there's a quote here from Dan Pena, who you may know who he is. He's a little bit abrasive, but he's got some wisdom within the abrasiveness. And his quote is, man's greatest burden is unfulfilled potential, Right. And so that unfulfilled potential falls on you. And so for me, my biggest why is myself. I feel like I have a lot of potential that I need to live up to. And I need to, you know, you get one swing at this life and, um, you know, I want to try and do the most that I can with it. Now, of course, taking care of my family and, and building a life for myself and them is part of that. But ultimately, my why is me. I, a couple of months ago, I had a guest on here, Lawrence Thompson. And he's one of the few guests that I've had on that was not a real estate investor. And he was a motivational speaker out of Tennessee. And his, he used a, a similar quote, but his was be selfish, be selfish enough to make sure that you live up to your potential. And, and that really stuck with me. And, and I, I appreciate you being honest enough because you're right. I mean, it is, it's easy to say family. You know, um, anybody can say that as, as long as they have family and, and to sit there and, and say that's what their driving force is. But um, I appreciate you sitting there and, and letting us know that it's also to make sure that you're holding up your end of the bargain for yourself, essentially. Yeah. And, you know, the reality is, is that once you get a certain amount of money in the bank or assets under control, like your family's taken care of. Right. So then what? What is it that drives you? Right. And so, um, you know, I, that number, those, that amount of assets that you have, it, it varies from person to person. But at the end of the day, if you reach that threshold, then what drives you? And so I think you need more than that. And so for me, you know, obviously family's part of that, but it, me is me, right? So, Right. So for anybody that's listening and they want to contact you, what's the best way to contact you outside of listening to the Real Deals podcast? 
Uh, you can find me on Facebook. Just search Tucker Merrihue. Um, that would probably be the best way I connect with most of, uh, you know, people out there in the, in the real estate investing world via that. I don't have like a, you know, a profile that's just for friends and family. It's, you know, for everybody. So that would be the best way. And then, um, you know, of course, if you want to listen to the real deals podcast, just search the real deals with a Z podcast and iTunes. And, um, you know, you can hear me in your earbuds all you want. <laughs> awesome. Tucker. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to sit down with us today and share about your business. And, uh, you know, I, I expect to, to see you do much bigger deals in, uh, in Portland here in the next five years. And I uh, appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, well, hey, I appreciate you having me on. I always love doing these things. So thank you very much. All right, man. We'll talk to you soon. Great. Thanks so much for listening to the Titanium Vault with your host, RJ Bates III. For more info and to stay up to date, visit www.podcast.thetitaniumvault.com and on facebook.com slash thetitaniumvault. If you enjoyed the episode, please rate and review, and we'll catch you next time on the Titanium Vault. Titanium Vault.